My name is David, and this is Andrea, and we're from Facebook, and we are going to talk to you today about how to make your system firmware faster, more flexible, and more reliable using Linux boot. So first thing I want to talk about is some of our open source initiatives at Facebook. Um, when you think of open source at Facebook, you probably already think of our involvement with software projects such as the Linux kernel, CentOS, Chef, Systemd, and so on. However, it turns out we're also involved with open source hardware. We founded the Open Compute Project to bring about the same kind of creativity and collaboration we see in open source software to hardware. And we also founded the Telecom Infrastructure Project to similarly accelerate the pace of innovation in the telecom industry. Uh, these efforts have both gained a lot of traction over the years. Open Compute Project is over 100 members strong, and the Telecom Infrastructure Project, or TIP, is over 500 members strong at this point. So when you think of open source at Facebook, think of both open source software and hardware. So those efforts are pretty well established. Uh, but there is an important piece that's uh, it's been missing uh, throughout the years, but we're, starting, we're finally gaining some traction with it. Uh, can anyone guess what that is? Hmm. Mostly right. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's about half right. We, we've, been, uh, getting, we've been dipping our toes in that. So a few short years ago, some Facebook engineers identified proprietary BMC firmware as a pain point for our operations. A BMC, or a baseboard management controller, is an independent microcontroller present in many server and networking platforms that typically performs monitoring and management functions. Our engineers were unsatisfied with the vendor-provided solutions and decided to implement one using a Linux distribution, Yocto in this case, and write the tools needed for management. This became OpenBMC and was publicly released in 2015. With BMC firmware finally opened up and OpenBMC becoming the standard in OCP equipment, system firmware became the next logical step. So what is system firmware? Uh, well, you just heard me mention BMC firmware, and you might also be familiar with other kinds of firmware in the system, such as the NIC firmware, hard drive firmware, SSD firmware, uh, Intel management engine firmware on Intel platforms, and so on. So when I, when I say system firmware, I mean the firmware that runs on the CPUs and boots much of the, the rest of the system, usually interacting with other components and running their firmware, such as option ROMs, in the process. It's the first bit of code that runs when the processor is turned on, and it's sometimes referred to as BIOS, especially in the x86 world, um, which is a little bit of an outdated term, but we'll get into that later. So system firmware serves two fundamental purposes, initialize hardware and load your operating system. It's an important and integral part of any modern general computing platform. Code running er this early on generally has to deal with some pretty funky constraints that you might not uh, be used to if you write a lot of apps. For example, when you're running code this early, you don't have nice things such as DRAM or even caches. Uh, things get really interesting on x86 because even on the most modern Xeon processors running at 3 gigahertz with 30 cores or whatever, that each of those cores still comes up thinking it's a 40-year-old 8086 in 16-bit mode with one megabyte of addressable space. So there's actually a fair bit of work to be done just to get the processor into a state where you can actually run useful code. And then once you do that, you still have a lot of hardware initialization to do so that you can actually load your operating system. Simple, right? So let's take a couple examples, uh, the first one being storage. About and we'll see how this problem has gotten a lot more complex over the years. So first off, you'll notice the sheer quantity of devices has exploded over the years. Back then, you maybe had one de facto standard that you had to worry about. These days, you have many interfaces with many generations and many controllers. I mean, we see you know, SATA, NVMe over PCI Express. Um, PCI Express also has you know, Gen 1234. You got SATA 123. EMMC has a couple generations. You might have removable devices. Um, USB is a real hoot if you've ever dealt with that, if you've ever had to deal with UHCI, OHCI, XHCI, EHCI. If you're talking about the new Type C stuff, you might have dual role ports. You got to figure out if you're an upstream facing port or a downstream facing port. So this all takes a pretty substantial amount of code to figure out. The links have gotten a lot faster. Used to be your electrical engineer would wire things up, you'd hit the power button, and you'd be ready to rock. Uh, these days, you might have to configure power and clock trees, enumerate, configure, and train buses, again, especially PCI Express, and probe the capabilities and configuration of the device that you're trying to use. And then lastly, now that you can actually talk to the device, you have to load something off of it and then execute it. 
back in the old days, you would simply find the first thing you could on sector head cylinder 001, otherwise known as the master boot record, load it, and run it. <laughs> um, it seems a little bit silly these days to just blindly execute code like that. These days, you might want to decrypt a partition, mount a file system, and you know, actually verify that the thing you're about to execute is what you think it is. So another example, networking. Networks used to be a lot simpler too, and network booting once meant you were going to load your operating system off of a machine across a room on the same LAN. These days, we want to think on a global scale. Uh, we want to be able to netboot an OS image from across the data center, maybe across the world, or maybe you know, on a completely untrusted network out in the open somewhere. Like storage, there's many, dev many more devices, interfaces, and protocols with varying levels of complexity, robustness, and security. Current netboot technology, such as Pixie Boot, was mostly designed in the 80s and 90s and relies on things like TFTP. <laughs> Now, you wouldn't trust sending your credit card information or any other sensitive personal data over the internet using TFTP. So why would you boot your data center infrastructure that way? It's time to use protocols that were designed with security in mind and truly bring network booting into the 21st century. So booting has gotten pretty complicated over the years. And the system firmware itself has basically become an OS with drivers and network stack, crypto libraries, shell, applications, and hey, even sometimes a 3D graphics stack on some of those uh, cool new gamer motherboards. Different parts of the stack come from different parties, silicon vendors, what we call independent BIOS vendors or IBVs, ODMs, OEMs, etc. And in fact, um, so the BIOS is kind of an old term that usually refers to a monolithic BIOS code base. These days it's more of a distribution. So you have millions of lines of code coming from several parties that run at the highest privilege level and have unfettered access to your networking and, resource, networking and storage resources. And yet somehow this ecosystem has remained stubbornly closed. The tooling needed to support it is also usually quite proprietary and specific to a limited range of products. A firmware update utility that runs on one server might not work on another server from a different vendor. In fact, it probably won't. And if you were to try it on your laptop, you'd probably end up with a brick as your laptop. So, in short, system firmware has become a big, closed, complicated mess with some pretty scary security implications. So it's no wonder they scheduled this talk on Halloween. <laughs> so what we really want is something open. And if we're going to have an OS in the system firmware anyway, it should be something familiar that we have experience working with. In other words, we want Linux. Linux is familiar to us. We have teams of engineers who are supporting Linux at all levels, kernel, tools, services, etc. And hopefully you got a chance to meet a few of them at this conference. We want debuggability. Linux is debuggable. Our engineers are experienced with this code base, and it's not just debuggable in the sense that you know, we get a few tools to hack with. It's debuggable in the sense that people actually have a lot of expertise and understand this code very well. And similarly, we want auditability. Linux is auditable not just in the sense that we have access to the millions of lines of code in there, but again, our engineers understand this very well. They understand the flow and hopefully can identify issues and security concerns a lot, a lot more easily than they can with some uh, binary blob. And of course, the tools are open and Linux is portable and reusable. You can put it on anything ranging from servers to toaster ovens. So Linux is where the development momentum is, and we can leverage this momentum to improve our firmware. Uh, so a quick aside. At this point, you might be thinking, what about UEFI? Uh, so quick poll. Who's heard of UEFI? Excellent. So multiple choice question here. Who thinks UEFI is something you can download to boot your computer? Okay. Who thinks UEFI is a giant PDF that specifies how various modules from different vendors interface with one another? <laughs> very good, very good. So the important thing to remember is that UEFI is not a firmware implementation. It is a specification. It's thousands of pages long and references other specifications that are also thousands of pages long. And it's used by various parties to write modules that are supposed to be compatible with one another. So you can kind of think of it like POSIX, but for firmware. So when someone asks you, uh, what OS do you run? You don't say POSIX. You say... I'm running 
GNU Linux, or maybe you name the vendor, like I'm running Red Hat Linux or Debian Linux, or maybe FreeBSD or AIX or Solaris or whatever, and they all have some commonality and some interoperability because they implement parts of the POSIX spec. So similarly, UEFI is implemented by various vendors um, according to the specification, and some examples of those vendors uh, include like AMI with their Aptio firmware, uh, Phoenix, Secure Cortiano, Inside HTO, H2O, and in the open source world, there's also Coreboot and Uboot, which also implement parts of the UEFI spec. So if someone asks you what firmware you're running, you shouldn't just say UEFI, but you should say AMI, Aptio, H2O, Coreboot, Uboot, whatever. So the approach that we're taking is known as Linux boot. And the idea here is simple. The main idea with Linux boot is to put Linux with an embedded environment, an init ramifest, in the boot ROM alongside the firmware, the boot firmware, and jump to it once the system is in a sane state and can actually run useful, pro um, useful code. This builds on the UEFI specification because in our case, uh, you see we're using core boot at the very beginning, that implements parts of the UEFI spec to get into, and it allows us to uh, deal with the silicon initialization modules that we use to initialize the hardware, and then we jump to Linux as soon as we can. So once we're in Linux, we can let Linux deal with initializing the storage and the networking resources, and we can reuse tools that we use elsewhere to carry out the remaining steps. So this gives us the same production quality device drivers and networking facilities that we're used to supporting in the runtime environment. In other words, we're actually taking code from our runtime environment and using it to boot the runtime environment. The, uh, the uh, runtime environment. So being able to build a bootable system firmware image enables us to develop, debug, build, and deploy as needed on our schedule. And there are a few other side benefits too. So the security model can be tailored to the threat model and use case. Uh, for example, you might have different physical access and security requirements based on is your server in a tightly guarded data center or is your server somewhere out in the field? And uh, in, in some of the exotic cases, it might literally be out in the field. We can also boot very fast. If we strip out all the stuff we don't need and let Linux handle the rest, we can pretty easily boot in under 10 seconds. This makes things like provisioning and upgrades faster and less disruptive, and it also makes debugging a lot less miserable. I mean, so, so how many people have, you know, watched a server reboot? It, it's pretty painful, right? And, and usually you don't watch a reboot. You hit the reset button, and then you go get coffee and come back like 30 minutes later, and maybe it's done. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it's been described as an evil video game. <laughs> and yeah, maybe, maybe the creators are playing with us. <laughs> and we also want to modernize the code development process. So anyone who's dealt with trying to debug a proprietary BIOS knows that this usually entails several days or maybe weeks of emailing the vendors back in Taiwan or China or whatever, and then you get a binary at the end and you pray that it works. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. <laughs> What we want is to have publicly visible code review so that anyone can participate and relevant decisions and discussions can be referenced. <coughs> we also want a full history so that any line of code can be traced back to its origin. Um, I, I noticed Bloomberg is here, and, and maybe we have some Bloomberg folks in the audience, and they can tell you that supply chain attacks are a real thing. System firmware has become a much bigger target in recent years due to its high privilege level and relative obscurity. So that's an overview of what we're doing. So why are we doing this again? So this is basically what Facebook's infrastructure looks like today. It's come a long way in a short time from the days when the whole thing ran off of a computer in Zuck's dorm room. This montage is actually a little bit old. It's, it's missing a couple data centers, but eh, after a while, you lose track. So that's a lot of servers, and it's a lot of switches too, and it's a lot of generations of hardware in, that, in those data centers. And we're not just working on data centers. Here's a photo of some open cellular hardware, which is part of the telecom infrastructure project that I briefly mentioned earlier on. And these are things that go out literally in the field. <laughs> you know, some of them are mounted on trees in rural Africa, for example. So we're working with our partners to build and improve communications infrastructure around the world. <laughs> 
Facebook's mission is to give people the power to build community and bring the world closer together. And um, currently, a little less than half the world's population has internet access. So we're helping to get those people online. It's going to take a lot of hardware and a lot of firmware to do that. So you've probably heard a lot about scale at this conference. You've you probably heard that word like a million times in the last two days. So in this case, we're talking about scaling firmware development across a wide variety of hardware projects that Facebook is working on, ranging from servers to networking to embedded devices, and also running on multiple hardware architectures. Using open source enables us to support more hardware with common firmware and tools that are better understood and actively developed by our engineers. So in short, we're turning our Linux engineers into firmware engineers. And on that note, here's Andrea to talk about how we're actually provisioning this hardware. Thank you, David. So my name is Andrea, and I'm a production engineer at Facebook. Uh, my team is called Host Provisioning Engineering. We are responsible for laying down the operating system on the Facebook uh, bare metal fleet. Uh, as many people here know, that uh, installing an operating system is pretty easy uh, on a few machines, but it gets uh, pretty challenging at scale. Uh, there, are a lot of, there are a lot of moving parts. There are a lot of network services involved. Uh, there is the network in between, of course, which uh, adds uh, additional noise to the process. So uh, this can become a pretty challenging uh, process. From a machine perspective, uh, this is how it looks. Uh, the machine powers on, and the firmware will try to, at least in the configurations that we are using at Facebook, the machine will try to acquire a network configuration via the HTTPv6. Uh, once the uh, configuration is acquired, it will try to download a network, network boot program via TFTP, and uh, then the installer starts. What happens in the rest is not uh, our concern now. Uh, let's focus a bit on, what, uh, on this part. What's wrong with it? Uh, it works most of the time. Uh, however, every firmware has different DHCP and TFTP implementations, and they may have bugs. And uh, since every vendor provides different firmers, they may have different bugs. So once you fix them on one side, they are not uh, necessarily fixed on the other side because the vendors don't share code. Even if it works most of the times, uh, at the scale of a very small fraction, way below 100% of uh, failures can translate into a lot, of, a lot of operations. And we don't want these operations to be manual. Can Linux Boot help in this process? Yes. Uh, Linux Boot can simplify provisioning a lot because having control over what runs on our firmware means that we can run uh, battle-tested network drivers, DHCP and TFTP implementations within our firmware. Uh, it's not just that. We can use better protocols. As David mentioned, TFTP, you would not run uh, anything confidential over TFTP. Uh, why should we be using this for our infra? We can use HTTPS for that, for example. We can do signature verification. We can do a lot more things. Another big benefit is that we have consistent tooling across uh, the various platforms. Uh, David mentioned again that uh, different vendors have different tools for uh, dealing with the firmware, with upgrades, etc. and running the wrong tool on the wrong machine may break your machine. With the Linux boot, you can have uh, one single consistent set of tools that will behave differently and appropriately depending on the machine it's running on. Uh, the huge benefit, in my opinion, is that on top of all of this, uh, uh, is that we control and know what we are running on our machines. This is not the only issue with firmware. Uh, it's not just pixie booting. Uh, it's not just reliability, but it's also testing and uh, upgrades, because a machine needs to be upgraded when you find bugs. Uh, currently, it works in a way that we depend a lot on vendors. Uh, this means that every time a vendor uh, produces a new firmware, uh, they will do their own testing. They will provide us with the binary blobs. Uh, then we will have to go through testing again, because of course we don't know what the vendor has tested. We need to test it again on our side and make sure that uh, it's matching our standards and our, and our requirements. We do the testing on our side, etc. then we eventually deploy it to prod. Uh, and once it's deployed to prod, we may find bugs. For example, yay, the usual DHCP client that is failing. Uh, and, uh, we have to restart this process again. We find the bug, we communicate the bug to the vendor. Uh, the vendor will try to reproduce in their infrastructure, which is not always easy, given that our infras are usually very different. Uh, once they fix the bug, they will have to do testing again. And they will have to end off again the binary blob, and we will do testing again over on site. And as you can imagine, this is a very time-consuming process. It can, can go from weeks to months, or even longer. Uh, 
Uh, and this is just not acceptable because, because if there's a bug, we want to get this fixed as soon as possible. It's not just operations, it could be a security bug, which leaves a long time window uh, open with security vulnerabilities on our machines. Uh, as we said, uh, we also want to speed up this process, but we also want to do uh, in-house debugging so that how nice would it be if you could run TCP dump on your firmware, for example, so you know why it's failing to boot. Uh, and with Linux boot, all of this becomes possible. So far, we focused uniquely on firmware, but it's not just firmware. Uh, Linux boot is so, ver uh, it's so flexible and versatile that we can reuse most of its components for other purposes. For example, uh, to boot an OS installer or uh, similar things that uh, we're going to see in a second. Uh, this is easy, easily doable, but it's also desirable because we want to boot the infrastructure with the same code that we run, uh, used to run our infrastructure. Uh, one single code base is easier to monitor, to test, to fix, and, to, and we have more control over, over this. Uh, we are currently experimenting with a couple of projects that we call Prob Launcher and Yard. Uh, these are not running in firmware. These are running... Uh, these are normal software projects, but they are based on Linux boot components, the ones that we will see in a few slides. Uh, Prob Launcher is a pre-provisioned uh, image that we install on our hard drives, and this, is, this becomes the primary boot image. So instead of booting a machine via DHCP from the firmware itself, when we use Prob Launcher, we use Prob Launcher as first boot entry. Uh, so we skip entirely the DHCP and TFTP clients uh, on the firmware side. And this prob launcher will have battle-tested uh, drivers, uh, clients, and can use encryption and signature verification and so on. This means it's a lot more robust. Uh, of course, you will still need to pre-provision this image in some way. So you will still need the first time to uh, install the image on the disk. And that's why we de also developed the YARD, which stands for yet another RAM disk. Names are hard. Uh, and uh, uh, this image is based on pretty much the same components, but what it does is that it's optimizing size, so it's really small and easy to download via TFTP. Even if TFTP is low and uh, uh, prone to failure rates, you cannot download uh, large images, or if it takes too long, it will just time out. Uh, Yard allows us to uh, boot a minimal environment that will then have all the stable and reliable clients we just discussed. So let's see a little bit how the architecture of Linux boot uh, is, uh, works at Facebook. Specifically for Facebook, we are using a stack of multiple open source uh, components. The first one is Coreboot that David mentioned. Uh, and uh, we use Coreboot just for the minimal hardware initialization. So when we don't even have the DRAM or the CPU is not uh, ready yet to work for our purposes, we, do, we still need to do silicon and DRAM initialization, memory training, and so on, all the basic stuff before we can hand control to a higher level system. Once core boot is done with this process, uh, it will hand off the control to uh, a Linux kernel, which, as uh, all of you know, uh, will do the usual platform, uh, sorry, uh, device driver initialization. All the uh, systems and NIC uh, will be initialized. We will have all the drivers that the machine needs, for example, for accessing uh, file systems and so on. <clears throat> and we also provide a network stack uh, and a familiar multi-user and multi-tasking uh, environment. So once the kernel is loaded, just like in any regular operating system, and we're still talking about firmware in this case, uh, we need a user space where you can run uh, your Linux command, LS, PS, etc. Uh, this is done by the combination of uroot and system boot. Uh, that's the one we use specifically at Facebook. Uroot is a RAMFS, uh, very similar to BusyBox in a way, uh, that provides us with a familiar Linux environment, which means it, this gives us all the basic Linux commands. System boot is a set of additional libraries and tools on top of your root uh, that allows us to give us uh, the bootloader personality and also the tools that are required to boot in different booting scenarios, like booting from the network, uh, making sure that it, uh, you only boot uh, if the signature is verified, etc. More in detail, your root uh, is a very interesting project. Uh, you can think of it like BusyBox, but, busy but it's entirely written in Go. Uh, it, the fact that it's written in Go uh, gives us a bunch of uh, positive uh, uh, stuff, like uh, Go is multi-architecture, so we can run on x86 or ARM, like David mentioned, uh, Open Cellular uh, uh, can, is one of the alternative platforms that uh, is multi-architecture. Uh, but it also gives a single binary, just like BusyBox. The same link will determine what command is actually executed. Uh, 
Everything is collapsed in one single binary blob. Uh, it's not just that. Uroot is very interesting also for its the so-called source mode. Uh, this means that instead of providing one single binary uh, that will contain all the commands, you can have the source code of your commands on the firmware chip, on the flash chip, uh, and you will have also a Go compiler on board. This means that every time you run a command, for example, the first time you run ls or ps or whatever command, the Go compiler uh, will be invoked, will build uh, the will build the command and will run it. The Go compiler is really fast, uh, which means that it takes a few hundred milliseconds for a new command to be fully compiled uh, before it starts the execution. And this is, uh, this is great for troubleshooting. Imagine the case where uh, your tools are failing to boot uh, and you want to know what's going on. Instead of building an image on your lap developer laptop, flashing it, trying and repeating this process, which is very time consuming. Imagine that you can actually modify with VI the source code of your firmware on the firmware itself while you're logged on your serial console or BNC. Uh, and then you modify your file, rerun the command, and it's compiled on the fly again with your changes. The nice thing of this is that this is ephemeral. So once you reboot, all the changes that you've done uh, go away and you're back on your stable or buggy firmware. The project was created in, uh, originally at Google. We are contributors of this project, and uh, other companies are also involved in this process, like Nan Elements to Sigma and so on. Uh, and this is a community effort. The great thing about this is that it's open source first. It, there is no internal code, but it's developed directly online with a shared roadmap, with uh, uh, roadmap meetings, continuous syncs every, every two weeks. Uh, that makes this a fully open source project, even if it's cross-company. Uh, system boot, as I said, is an additional set of tools. I like to think of it as a Linux boot distribution. Uh, this implements, it's a distribution that implements a bootloader. Uh, and being based on new root, it's also written in Go, uh, with all the benefits that we just discussed. And as been the, the system boot has been developed uh, in order to provide us with flexible tools for different booting scenarios, uh, but it also allows us to iterate very fast on the code. The workflow, is, the workflow is very simple if you're used to UFI. Uh, the boot entries have uh, familiar names like boot 0000 and so on, one, two, three, incremental. Uh, and the name will determine which one will be attempted first. Uh, for each one of these boot entries that are stored on the flash chip, uh, the si system boot will look for a booter, uh, which is a sub-program. It's a bunch of code that will uh, determine how your machine is going to try to boot, for example, the HTTP. If it fails, it will try the next booter, uh, and it will continue trying until it uh, excels all the list of booters, and it will start over again until something works, just like uh, uh, UFI as we are used to on uh, normal servers. Let's see an example of this. Uh, on the left, uh, there is a configuration for a booter. As you can see, it's JSON, because JSON is easy to understand for both machines and humans. Uh, on the left, we have an example of how to tell the machine to boot via the network. Uh, there is an additional field that says method DHCPv6. It could be DHCPv4, it could be Slack, uh, it could be anything uh, that, is, uh, that can allow us to boot over the network. And there is an additional field MAC address which will determine which interface it's going to boot from. Uh, similarly, on the right side you can see how you boot from local disks. You specify a device GUID, a path to a kernel, optionally a RAMFS, kernel command line, etc., and the booter will uh, start and KXAC your machine. As I said, the Go compiler is really fast, and we are leveraging this a lot. Uh, and building system boot in your root is really uh, easy. All you need to do is uh, download the dependencies, in this case, your root and system boot. Um, then you use the your root builder to put everything together, and this will generate a CPIO file that is suitable for being embedded in a kernel and booted. You can use QEMU if you want to do some testing, so it's also easy to test without necessarily flashing it on a machine. And you can just pass the dash init um, argument to QM, and you will see how would it look like uh, on a real machine. I previously mentioned that you can also define your own boot methods uh, or your own boot policies. For example, you want to try, you want to implement an additional booter that says try to boot from whatever is attached to this machine or whatever kind of storage or whatever kind of network uh, until something eventually works. That may be useful or not for you. You are, really have the freedom to do to decide what you need. Uh, 
Uh, but you can also additionally define uh, boot policies. Uh, as I mentioned, with OpenCellular, we want to fail immediately if the machine, if the image is wrong, if the signature does not match what we expect. Uh, but in Data Center, we may want not to break the machine. We may want to continue booting and then leave the decision of taking the machine out to the remote attestation and network isolation. Yeah, almost there. Uh, if you want to implement a new one, you just need to define a JSON structure and a boot method uh, with your custom logic. Let's see uh, an example. The, this is the definition of the netbooter, the existing netbooter. Uh, the JSON is very simple. You just define a type, method, the MAC address, and the, optionally a URL if you don't want to boot from whatever the HTTP says. And this is the implementation of the boot method. Uh, it's very simple. It just will just run an external command that implements the HTTP uh, and the KXEC. And uh, it will check and return successfully or not, depending on whether this worked. We have a quick demo. Should be a few seconds. Oh, man. Where'd it go? Too many tops. Yeah. All right. It's a video because live demos are dangerous. Uh, so here I'm showing a Wedge 100S, which is a switch that we run in our data centers. Uh, in the video, I just sent a command that electrical, electrically resets the machine. It takes a few seconds before the command is actually executed. As soon as the machine turns on, you will see the core boot messages. Uh, core boot is, as I said, um, the software that initializes the machine, uh, the DRAM, the silicon, etc. Is it? No. Yeah, it's playing. Oh, sorry, got stuck. Back. Even non-live demos can be dangerous. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So this is core boot. And at some point, core boot will hand off the control to Linux. Linux, uh, you will see familiar messages about initialization, initialization of the device drivers, network stack, and so on, until you root and system boot are executed. And here you will see that it will try to net boot. But to show you how interesting this is, I will control C here and show you that there is an actual Linux shell in your firmware. We are not booting yet. We are still in the firmware. We are running commands like ls, ps, ip, and so on. Then, in this demo, I uh, eventually show the local boot command, which will boot from local disk. And this is the, uh, it finds uh, a suitable kernel on the hard drive and it will boot it. All right, uh, this is all. There are a bunch of links at the bottom for you to get started with uh, Linux Booth. Uh, questions? Yeah. <laughs> okay, right. one question. Uh, with Linux Booth, can I boot only Linux kernels then afterwards, or can I boot like? let's say, a Zen hypervisor, then a Linux, or even a Windows or something like that? Yeah, so at the moment, you can only KXEC into a KXEC-compatible kernel, but it's in our roadmap to boot whatever system. Uh, the only thing is it's not high in a roadmap, so it may be implemented probably next year. Can I burn this onto the board on a, a off-the-shelf hardware I already own? And if not, uh, when and where can I buy uh, off-the-shelf hardware that I can use this with? Uh, so that's, it, it's an interesting question. Um, currently our main target is open compute project hardware, so if you can buy that, then, um, and, and there are some vendors we can chat a little bit later on if you want to get some of that. Um, and there are, there are some other targets like, uh, I think the Dell 2600, something or other. Um, yeah, we're, we're slowly expanding our, our scope. It's just for now our, our target is open compute hardware. But we, we can... Sorry. We can also run on Chromebooks, for example. Anything that where core boot runs uh, is a potential target for Linux boot. So then in case of, say, you said Dell supports some open compute hardware, what happens to the proprietary out-of-band management systems and other hardware that gets initialized during the boot? So on the open compute hardware, we're getting rid of the... I, we've already mostly um, replaced the proprietary BMC firmware with OpenBMC. Um, 
and, and yeah, we can certainly interact with the BMC however we need to um, from core boot or Linux boot. Thank you. Mm -hmm. right, thank you very much. Thank you.